Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about why Chandra Babu Naidu, the former Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, has been arrested by the CID. We also talk about the attack that the cotton crops are facing from the pink ballworm. But first, we bring you a story where an IAS officer was actually punished by the government for doing her job well. This story takes place in UP, in a small and remote village of Lahuriada. Lahuria Da is a village in Mirzapur district and it's located very close to the Madhya Pradesh border that UP shares with the neighbouring state. That's Asad Rahman, who reported on the story for the paper. And this village Lahuria Da, which is a small village and is located on a hilltop. And to reach the village, you have to take an upward trek by road. The village has a population of around 1,500 people and falls in the most backward regions of eastern UP. And the area has several issues, employment being one of them. And like economically also the village struggles a lot and the houses in the village are not pakka houses. Most of them have thatched roofs and there is a lot of economic hardship in the area and in this village specifically. And the village is inhabited mostly by people from the Dalit community. So the village does have other problems, but the main issue that the village has been facing for decades or centuries, one can say, is the issue of tapped water. Asad says that even after more than 75 years of the country's independence, tap water has still not reached the village. And that's the biggest problem for this village because the people over there have to walk or go far off to fetch water for their needs to clean and to do other things. And water is the main and primary problem that these people in the village face. He says a total of 15 villages in this area make up one Gram Sabha. And out of the 15, all of the villages get water except Lahuria Da. So Lahuria Da does not get water and the Gram Pradhan Kaushal Gupta told us that uh, to give water to this village through private tankers from private companies, they have to spend a lot of money. One tanker in a day costs 800 rupees. And the village generally requires 8 to 10 tankers on regular days through the year and requires more than 15 in the summer when the heat gets unbearable. So this Gram Sabha which Devhat, Devhat is in currently in debt of 20 lakh rupees and the other villages are not getting the funds meant for development because most of the funds that the Devhat Gram Sabha gets are spent on providing drinking and regular water to this one village. That is why this Gram Pradhan says that they are currently in debt of more than rupees 20 lakh and it's not incurred in the last one or two years since he has been the village head, but it's been there for years. And that it's, he used the word Virasat, that we Virasat mein mila hai ye, or uh, it's the legacy of the Gram Sabha and this specific village that it's suffering so much and it's still going into debt. and. That development in the whole Gram Sabha, which comprises 15 villages, is put on stop just to provide water to this one village. In fact, when he spoke to the residents of the village, they told him that people from the neighbouring villages refused to get their children married to them. Because they know that water is an issue which is not going to be addressed anytime soon and has not been addressed over the years. So, People in this village are forced to marry their sons and daughters within the village because nobody from outside is going to send their daughter to the village. And that's a big issue for these people. And even young people in the village complain that they don't get marriage proposals because it becomes difficult for someone to send their daughter to this village after marriage, knowing that she's not going to get access to drinking water or clean water for daily use basic needs like washing and bathing and washing clothes and dishes and things like that. So that is also a larger issue between this whole issue of water, that marriage of young people in the village is not done from outside because of this issue of water. But after centuries of facing a water problem, last month, this village finally got tap water. 
And this was something that the residents had been desperately in need of. And it was made possible because of Divya Mittal, the newly appointed district magistrate of Mirzapur. Mittal has done her MBA from IIM Bangalore and her B.Tech from IIT Delhi. And she had actually been an exotic derivatives trader in London before she quit her job to join the civil services. So, in September last year, district magistrate who was newly posted in Mirzapur, Divya Mittal, went on a visit to the village after she received written complaints from the village head and other locals that water had still not reached the village. And Mittal went to the village and she spoke to the people and locals say that she was very sad about the fact that water had still not reached the village and that people were struggling for something as basic as water. Now, locals say that Mittal that day refused to mingle with the locals and sit with them saying that I'm not going to drink water from my water bottle in front of you people unless I ensure that water reaches here in the taps that I'm going to put. This was in September last year. Now, around six months later, after a lot of efforts and a lot of coordination, Mittal got the job done. Getting water to this place was not just challenging in terms of geography, but also in terms of bureaucracy. Like there are multiple departments involved. There is a lot of paperwork. There is a lot of like red tapeism that such projects face because if it's one department, then it's fairly straightforward that you can tell the people in the department and the officers in the department to do their job. But if someone is not under your jurisdiction, if someone is part of like a different department, then it becomes harder for an official to get things done. Even if the will is there, there is a lot of delay and lag in these things. So Mittal ensured that like this lag doesn't happen. She took a lot of initiative. She did multiple visits to the village, met people, figured out how the water is going to reach. Now the water to this village comes from around 30 kilometers away and has to be treated first before it can battle the region's topography and finally reach its destination. But Mittal kept at it. People told Asad that she even reprimanded officials in front of the villagers when they weren't doing their jobs. And this is how she eventually completed this task, for which many had lost hope. So on August 30th, the locals and the village had told me that it was suddenly decided by the district magistrate that she's going to come and that the work was complete and that she's going to open the first tap in the village. This was a huge moment for the village. There were no taps before this. All this was done in the last six months that a pipeline was laid and this elaborate system was put up and that tap water connections were put up in every household. Some houses have more than five taps because the family members say that Sir, we are five brothers and if tomorrow we separate, then how are we going to separate the tap? So some houses have taken five connections saying that we are five brothers or five sub families within the larger family. So that if tomorrow there is a dispute among the brothers, they are not deprived of water and that it does not become a reason for the fight. So this tap water pipelines were put everywhere. And on August 30th, Mittal called the local village head and told him that she's going to arrive soon and within the next couple of hours. And that she's going to hold a small ceremony which they call Jal Pujan. And uh, after that, she'll open the first tap and water will then continue to go to the village through taps. He says that on that day, the villagers were very excited and several of them extremely emotional. Because some of them who were elders had given up hope. They didn't think that water is ever going to reach this village in a tap. So then when on the day, a small Puja was held, everything was done and like she came and it was a very celebratory sort of event for the whole village. But this is where the story takes an abrupt turn and becomes tragic. And tragic in a way that also highlights the problems and absurdity of the local bureaucracy. Asa tells us what happened. So a local BJP leader, Vipul Singh, on August 30th, took offence to the fact that Mittal did not follow the protocol. Now, as per him, the protocol is that when a scheme like this, which is a central government scheme, which is being implemented, as per him, she should not have, you know, gone and done this puja and inaugurated this and that he felt that she broke the protocol by doing it herself rather than inviting the local MLA, MP and that 
So Vipul Singh, who's BJP vice president for Mirzapur district, took offense to this and he wrote a letter to Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath. Now, after this letter, it went viral on social media and just three days, four days later, it was informed that Mittal is being transferred to neighboring Basti district, which is also in eastern UP. Now, being a bureaucrat, Mittal had to follow these orders. And so she started packing her things immediately for Basti. Then, surprisingly, another IS officer, Andhra Vamsi, was posted as Basti district magistrate, which meant that Mittal had been put on wait list. He says that was when it became evident that the government was not happy with the way the Jal Poojan ceremony had taken place and the way Mittal was being praised. And Asad says the villagers were devastated upon hearing this news. Like how people reacted to Mittal being transferred is something that I have not seen in my career as a journalist. Because generally the relationship between an adhikari or an officer and the locals is cordial but never this intense. And I wouldn't have myself believed that something like this could have happened. But even four days after her transfer and after Mittal being put on wait list, when I spoke to locals, they were getting emotional about the fact that Mittal's not going to be in Mirzapur anymore. And uh, there were women who were crying and who were not happy and who were using all kinds of language for whoever's responsible for removing and transferring her, expressing the desire that she comes back to Mirzapur. And uh, there was anger, there was disappointment, there was despair, and you could see all of that in the people. This was Dev Kali, one of the residents of the village. She, along with several others, told Asad how heartbroken they were about this news. This also included the Pradhan of the village, Kaushalendra Gupta. अच्छा जिस दिन पता चला कि दिव्या मैडम जो यहाँ डिस्ट्रिक्ट मैजिस्ट्रेट थी उनको तबादला किया गया है उस दिन लोगों के बीच में क्या रिएक्शन रहा उस दिन जैसे कोई दुर्घटना में कोई अपना सगा संबंधी अपने घर परिवार का कोई सदस्य नहीं रह जाता सेम उस तरीके की कंडीशन हो गई थी जिन लोगों ने भी इस खबर को सुना वे लोग इन बात को पहचा नहीं पा रहे थे कि ऐसी ही चीजें हो सकती है इतना जल्दी आज तक के इतिहास में किसी भी जिलाधिकारी का तबादला नहीं हुआ है ये कैसे हो गया जो है और यहाँ के लिए तो वे एक तरह से विंध्याचल माँ के रूप में आई थी जो उन्होंने अपना काम इतने कम समय में किया जो और जनता से और काम इट्स सरप्राइजिंग टू एन एक्सटेंट बिकॉज इट सीम्स लाइक द विलेजर्स आर सैड एज इफ समन फ्रॉम देयर फैमिली इज गोइंग टू मूव आउट और समथिंग लाइक दैट इज है इट डजेंट सीम लाइक एन अधिकारी बींग ट्रांसफर्ड और एन ऑफिसर बींग ट्रांसफर्ड People say that after they got to know that Mittal is being transferred, they didn't cook food that night, and that there was like general grief in the whole village, like they had lost someone they loved. And besides this, what is also extremely tragic is that the village now no longer has tap water. Just a couple of days after Mittal was transferred, there were reports that pipeline leading to the village was broken by some anti-social elements. Now there was a police complaint, and the police is investigating the incident, and nobody knows who broke that pipeline. But the end result is that the water supply to the village through taps was again stopped, and now the villagers have gone back to depending on this small little pit of water, which is one point five kilometers away from the village, and it's a downhill then uphill trek to get the water from there, and private tankers, which cost a lot of money, and uh, again. Things have gone back to how they were earlier, and now villagers, locals have to go to a. They call it a jharna, but it's actually just a little reservoir of water, which rainwater collects there and like between rocks, and they go and wash their clothes over there, bathe over there, bring back some water in matkas and boxes to their homes, and use it for drinking and washing and other things. 
Now, although we have reached a rather dismal and grim end, Asad told us that while reporting on it, one of the things that he has come to realize that this is not just a story about hardship, but also about hope. Like if you see what Mittal did in this village or in the district or by bringing water is, you see that, you know, bonds can develop between people who come from very varying backgrounds. Now, Mittal is someone who's worked in London, who has a degree from IIT, IIM and all the most premier institutes of the country. She was in London and she had a job there. She quit that. She came back to India to appear for the civil services exam, cracked it, has won multiple awards after that. Now she's gone and developed a bond with a village which is so obscure and so remote and so far off and so backward. And it's just one of those stories, you know, it seems like it's come out of a movie. And, you know, the bond between these people, you see Mittal during her farewell crying and feeling sad, writing posts on Twitter. And she's also, she's also heartbroken that she's not going to be in Mirzapur anymore. And then you see that the people over there are also heartbroken. So you see that human relationships can develop cutting across class, caste and all these barriers that we see on a daily basis in life. And they can get so strong that, you know, it can result in people crying and like feeling sad about someone who's not directly related to them. They didn't know Mittal till six months ago. It's just in this quick span of time that they've seen her dedication, they've seen her like devotion to the work she does and to help the villagers that this bond is there. And next we talk about Andhra Pradesh. On Saturday, the former chief minister and president of the Telugu Desam Party N. Chandra Babu Naidu was arrested by the Criminal Investigation Department in an alleged multi-crore scam. The allegations are that Naidu transferred 241 crore rupees to shell companies in the guise of setting up skill development centres in the state. These centres were supposed to be part of the Andhra Pradesh State Skill Development Corporation. When we spoke to Indian Express's Deepti Mantiwari, he told us about its origins. See, the idea basically was to provide uh, skill to the unemployed youth so that it creates employment in the state. So this APSSDC was created. The basic idea was that the corporation would collect content from, you know, various educational courses offered all over the country and even from abroad and, you know, convert them into courses and offer it online to students who registered with the corporation. And for this, uh, the Naidu government signed a memorandum of understanding with Siemens India to set up skill development centers. Siemens, of course, is the German multinational corporation, which, among other things, focuses on industry, infrastructure and digital transformation. The project was to be executed by APSSDC in partnership with a consortium comprising Siemens, Industry Software India Limited and Design Tech Systems Private Limited. Siemens was tasked with establishing six centers of excellence. He says the total cost of the project was supposed to be over 3,300 crore rupees, out of which the government was supposed to pay around 10%, while the rest was supposed to be paid by Siemens. In 2015, Naidu even inaugurated 17 skill development centres in the state. And eventually his party, the TDP, also released around 371 crore rupees for the implementation of the project. This was actually a little more than what the government had to pay for. But the allegation around this project surfaced only later. See, as we know that Naidu lost the elections in 2019 and YS Jagan Mohan Reddy stormed to power with a massive uh, mandate. And uh, since then, actually, Jagan Mohan Reddy has kept many of the projects of uh, Naidu under probe, under investigation, because he had consistently accused the government of corruption. And in March 2021, Jagan claimed in the AP Assembly that this skill development corporation was actually a scam. And he said that uh, the rupees 371 crore that were allocated by the Naidu government were actually released in a hurry within three months of the launch of the project and without Siemens investing even a single rupee in the project. Then there were allegations that a major share of this uh, allocation by the government was actually siphoned off, probably for personal purposes or for asset creation of Naidu and his family, through a string of shell companies. 
to be precise 241 crore rupees was allegedly diverted to at least 5 shell companies according to the claims these companies did not provide or sell anything to the andhra pradesh government and uh, so the jagan government also instituted an inquiry under uh, the central investigation department of the state government and uh, now we see an arrest in that case deepthi man says that according to cid chandra babu naidu is the principal conspirator behind this entire scheme they have said that he has orchestrated the transfer of public funds to private entities via shell companies resulting in a loss to public exchequer and that this was all done for private gains so it is said that naidu possessed exclusive knowledge of the transactions leading to the issuance of government orders and memoranda of understanding making him central figure in the investigation and it is on this basis that they have even gone to the court and sought his uh, police custody and there are also allegations that a large part of this money was actually diverted through uh, some four five shell companies for the personal benefit of naidu so he remains the central figure in these investigations meanwhile it's not just naidu other members of the telugu desam party are also under the scanner we don't know if any of them are going to be arrested as yet in fact there has been an investigation by the enforcement directorate in the affairs of siemens where some people had been arrested earlier so it remains to be seen whether enforcement directorate also gets into the act later in this entire case and what's worth noting is that this arrest comes less than a year before the state elections take place and when naidu had been touring the entire state since november last year his son uh, nara lokesh is on a state wide padyatra to essentially as voice of the youth this padyatra is called so basically tdp is canvassing aggressively in light of the upcoming elections at the same time there are speculations that uh, tdp and the bjp may get together both for the assembly elections as well as the lok sabha polls along with uh, pavan kalyan so there are new alliances being formed let's remember that this alliance also existed earlier in for 2014 polls and uh, it was broken by naidu in 2018 when he walked out of india alliance on the issue of the special status for andhra pradesh and this alliance may be coming together again so many will see it as a ysr cp sort of you know trying to influence that this alliance does not get formed because there will be corruption charges against uh, naidu and bjp will find it difficult to ally with somebody who is uh, having corruption charges at the same time let's understand that though ysr cp supports bjp in almost all its bills in the parliament the relationship between ysr cp and bjp is not exactly a very comfortable one there is cbi investigation against family members of jagan and uh, in the vivekananda reddy murder case so there are all kinds of political forces at play currently in andhra pradesh how this will impact whether this is going to shore up naidu's popularity within the state or it is going to make him a hero or a victim is yet to be seen it is too early to say but yes the arrest does come at a very very crucial time when there will be elections in the state and there is less than one year to go for parliamentary elections and in the end we talk about cotton which is a very important crop for india and is currently under a fierce attack by an insect called the pink bollworm the widespread infestation of this pest has led many farmers to look for alternative crops to grow that is if they can afford to switch in the first place and it's worth noting that while this problem first came to light around 6 years ago it is now impacting cotton farmers significantly more to know more about this pest and the environmentally friendly methods being employed to combat it my colleague ucha sarman speaks to indian express's harish damodaran in this segment so harish can you first tell us how significant is cotton for india see cotton is grown on something like uh, 12.5 million hectares so if you take an average land holding of say 1 hectare it means over 1 crore farmers are growing this crop right and 1 crore farmers means say 5 crore people so it's obviously a very important crop it's uh, largely grown uh, by small holders and uh, mostly in dry land areas okay like in vidarbha marathwada telangana 
So I would say that uh, this is a crop that touches a lot of lives. And uh, it is not just a fiber crop. We associate uh, cotton with uh, basically cloth. And uh, in the case of India, I think about two thirds of our uh, cloth is it comes from cotton. So the association of cotton is mostly with fiber. But the fact is, the fiber is nothing but it is just a covering for the seed. The balance is all seed. And that seed in turn has two products. The first is when I crush the seed, I extract the oil. And that is cottonseed oil. So cottonseed oil is, uh, I think in states like Gujarat, it's the main oil today. You know, in Gujarat, cottonseed oil has replaced groundnut oil. It's the main oil which is used in cooking and frying. And after I extract the oil, what remains is what you call the meal, which is basically the de oil cake. And that is basically fed to your animals, you know, cows, buffaloes, goat. So cotton is a very unique crop, just like uh, coconut. It is a source of uh, not just fiber, which clothes us, but also food in the form of oil, which we use for cooking and frying and as feed, you know, because that is what uh, our cows and buffaloes eat, right? It's a protein source for them. And that is from where we get our milk. So this is a triple F crop, right? I mean, food, fiber and feed crop. Right, and now we are seeing a crisis in the cotton production where a new pest, the pink ballworm, is wreaking havoc. So talk to us about this pest and how it affects the cotton plant. See, cotton cultivation in India got a huge boost because of BT cotton. At one time, cotton was very susceptible to this insect pest called the American ballworm. So that was a huge uh, problem in the 90s and early 2000s. So therefore, farmers were very afraid of growing this crop. So that was when you had the BT cotton. So basically, BT cotton incorporated a foreign gene, you know, an alien gene which was isolated from a soil bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. So that's what is BT. And that particular gene basically coded for proteins which were toxic to this American ballworm, you know, which is also called the Helicoverpa armigera. And uh, because of that, you know, the cultivation really spread, your yields went up because you no longer had the threat from this uh, American ballworm. But what we have seen in the last, you know, maybe about six, seven years, over a period of time, you had other pests starting to come. So one of them was what is called the pink ballworm. And the evidence of it started sometime in 2013, 2014, where they found that uh, the larvae were, were surviving. They were able to chew the Bt cotton very comfortably, okay? And it was very clear that the Bt toxins, that the Bt proteins were not toxic to this particular pest. You know, they had survived. Right, and to what extent has the pink ballworm affected the country's cotton cultivation in the last 6-7 years? So I think it started off in Gujarat. I think it was uh, basically Amreli and Bhavnagar districts. Then I think after one year, they found that uh, it was surviving in Maharashtra. It was surviving in Telangana. It was surviving in Andhra Pradesh. And in 2021, you had a very bad attack of pink ballworm in Punjab, Haryana and Northern Rajasthan. So if you look at uh, Punjab, I think Punjab had about 2.6 lakh hectares under cotton. See, this year they have planted just 1.7 lakh hectares, you know, and because the farmers are mortally scared of the pink ballworm. And the pink ballworm, you know, you cannot control it through insects because uh, most of it, its activities are nocturnal, okay? At night, you can't see. And it is deep inside. So it's not easy to spray. You can't spray at night. So it has become a very destructive pest. So we are in a very dangerous uh, state. Today, there were reports, I think, from Rajasthan, where I think in a single district, something like, I think, about uh, 230 crore worth of cotton has been destroyed, you know. It has been basically destroyed by this pink ballworm. So, I think the pink ballworm is something which is a real threat to Indian cotton, you know. Right, so the BT gene in cotton is not working out now, and spraying insecticides is also not an option. And now, you write that the scientists have developed an alternative approach to address this problem known as the mating disruption technique. So, tell us about this technique and how it can help in alleviating this crisis. Yeah, this is a very interesting approach which is now happening. So, typically, say, when the moths lay egg, you know, the first stage is, you know, the eggs hatch, they form larva, and from larva, then they pupate for some period, and then they become moths, okay? Once I become a moth, 
my only trip is to breed so if i am a male moth i would like to find a female moth and then mate so in the case of mating what they have found is the female moths they secrete what is called a pheromone a pheromone has a distinct smell and aroma which attracts the male moth so scientists have been able to isolate this particular pheromone and then synthesize it make it into large scale manufacture synthesize it in a lab and then insert it in basically a pipe you know what is called a lure and then what you do is you tie this uh, pipe you know it's like a rope you tie this rope in plants you know so suppose in one acre there are about say 7000 8000 plants you tie these in about say 160 170 plants and these lures what they called as uh, pb knots they actually emit this particular pheromone so then what happens is the male moth then gets attracted to it you know so basically the pheromone has to be in adequate quantity you know and enough to attract it so the male moth basically most of the time then spends the time in the lure and then gets confused you know and ultimately he finishes his life cycle without finding a mate so which is why this thing is called mating disruption technology and uh, it is supposed to be more environment friendly also so this is an approach which seems to be working in the case of uh, pink ball worm and uh, they have been some good experiments in the last 2 uh, 3 years on this uh, mating disruption technology so i think uh, we need all the three you know whether it is breeding whether it is insecticides or whether it is uh, mating disruption so let's see how successful this is but one thing is very clear that pink ball worm is a serious problem in india and we need to find ways of uh, dealing with it and uh, it cannot be just spraying of pesticides you know the, which is not going to work in the long run you know so we need i suppose an integrated uh, approach to deal with this and protecting a very important crop which is i mean from the point of uh, fiber food and feed security You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, with help from Utsha Sherman, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcast at IndianExpress dot com. 